Welcome to Learning in the Making. I'm your host, Aran, and today I am super thrilled to be joined once again by the phenomenal, fantastic, fabulous facilitator, Jake Montano, for part two of Everybody Loves Puppets. Puppets. Um, Jake, how are you doing today? I'm doing the best that I can and hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. How are you doing today, Aran? I resonate with that. I love that. That That is also how I'm doing. Excited to be connecting. Excited to be connecting as well. Likewise and as always. Um, so, today Jake is teaching us how to take our puppet designs and turn them into puppet prototypes. So a prototype um, is really just an engineering vocabulary word or a design vocabulary word for turning your drawing or your sketch or your idea into a model that exists out in the real world. And then you can tinker with it, you can make adjustments, you can iterate um, to, turn your, to turn your model or your prototype into the best possible version that it can be. But uh, first, if you haven't already, head over to Everybody Loves Puppets, part one, where we can begin to talk about puppet and character design. Uh, we get into the first several steps of making our puppet versions of ourselves and some characters from a book. Um, and we're going to resume today. Awesome. Um, Jake, can you tell everybody who's joining um, what materials they will need to turn their puppet sketch designs into puppet prototypes? Absolutely, Aran. So the first thing I want to point out is uh, to get a piece of paper or something that works like paper. Cardboard works great, um, but whatever you have on hand, the stronger, the thicker that it is, the more durable a puppet it will be, but uh, printer paper works great too. Cereal boxes also work great. After that, you want to get a drawing uh, utensil, pen, paper, marker. I love markers. I love color. So I like to keep a nice little plastic baggie of them. Uh, the next thing you'll need are some scissors. I'll hold it up sort of swatch style. Um, scissors are something else to cut your puppet pieces with. Um, and then lastly, we've got some fasteners. I've got colorful types here. I've got a nice little bowl. Might be a little bit hard to see without all of them sort of falling out. Actually, let's do that. Um, and these are gonna be what connects our different pieces together. This will be really crucial for making sure that your puppet isn't just like a paper doll, but something that's interactive, movable, and can help tell your story in a variety of ways. Sweet. Thank you, Jake, for letting us know what we will need for today's puppet construction. Um, actually, we are going to travel back in time a little bit um, to a past not so far away where in December, Jake and I both unplanned wore turtlenecks and made our puppet prototypes. So let's check that out. So what I've got here now is I've converted this sort of um, circular drawing into, there's, two, there's sort of two things that are happening here. The first one is that I've enlarged it. I've made it a little bit bigger. And that's because I know that I want to use a hole puncher, which I've got here. Um, I can also use just some scissors, definitely with uh, the kind of thing that needs a little bit of help, um, but a hole punch. And I'm gonna be using my fasteners here to assemble later on. So enlarging it is going to be the, it's the first thing that I did. And that's just so that I can make sure that the pieces are big enough for me to punch a hole through. And then later on, uh, when I assemble it, that it fits together nicely. And I can tell multiple stories um, and play around with my puppet. The second thing that I did um, was that I separated some of the pieces. This gets to be a little bit creepy um, because we're taking a full-fledged character design and splitting it up into different parts. Uh, you know, a zombie version of Julian, if you will. <laughs> um, 
but this is going to allow us to make changes, make adjustments. And I think that that's something that's really important, no matter what you're doing in the world of making and playing and tinkering, is making adjustments. If you like something, uh, you can keep it. And if you don't like something, think about what kinds of changes you'd like to make. The thigh here is, is one example. So now that I'm at this step, really it's just gonna be coming down to what kind of details do I wanna add? One thing that I know that I wanna add is one of my favorite uh, physical traits of Julian is that he just has beautiful hair. And so I can make these choices now. You'll also notice that with my puppet of Julian, I wanna have his face looking kind of to the side because I, later on want him to be able to move his fins around um, since the title of the book is Julian is a Mermaid. And uh, it, it might be just challenging to have him look like he's swimming towards me rather than moving side to side. So I'm gonna do a sideways. Nose, brows. I also really love that the, the puppet that you're making, um, you already have the movement in mind. I think it's also really important, especially if you're making a puppet either for the first time or the first time in a long time, um, that give, you know, giving it a go and making sort of a starter puppet already teaches you so much about what a next puppet might look like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, I started off by showing this, but this is, you know, the fifth puppet that I've made just this week alone. This was one of the first ones. Um, I have this Snoopy one that I have here. So um, the more you make puppets and the more you experiment and iterate, especially, the more you are able to make these choices and, and uh, decide for the vision that you have in your mind, what you'd like to create. Um, both in just the way the puppet moves, but also the way that you assemble it so that later on um, it can tell your story. And I agree with what you're saying. I think that the, the, the um, especially with puppet making, it can, there's, a, there's a, a lesson that I think is applicable across all kinds of making ex experiences, uh, which is that if there's a mistake that happens, uh, there really is just an opportunity to sort of decide uh, where your path is going to branch off uh, and becomes an opportunity really in, in a, a, an opportunity to uh, adjust to, to change something to add stuff to go a little bit backwards if you need to um, but that it doesn't mean that a road has ended it really just means that it branches off into a million other possibilities mm -hmm. Absolutely. What you can kind of see what I'm doing is um, there's like built in time to make adjustments, even as you're making your puppet, like I'm still cutting out the pieces uh, for my Julian puppet. And so what I'm doing as I'm cutting these things out is as I cut each piece, I'm kind of assembling it already in my mind uh, and on the paper, not even just on my, in, in my mind, but actually on this piece of paper to sort of think, okay, I like, since Julian's sort of facing to the right, um, I think I'm gonna put the head and neck on top of the torso here. I think that might be a little bit more expressive. Maybe not actually, we'll see. Um, but I'm definitely gonna be putting one of his legs behind his torso and then one in the front, which I think will just look better. Um, and then I've got the shoulder, which will also be behind. I think that just helps us get more truthiness out of its perspective. Um, but yeah, so the whole process is loaded already with opportunities to reflect on where you're at and what changes you'd like to make, if any. Um, and then you can go ahead and do those things. So I'm feeling pretty good about where my Julian puppet is. I'm not super big fan of the feet. I'll probably redraw those. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think that there's a lot of um, those traits, the, the lankiness, the sort of ability for Julian to sort of like lean forward, 
you know, uh, sort of do a puppet reenactment of, of Julian sort of floating in water, um, like we saw in the book. So I'm feeling pretty good about the pieces of my puppet. So the next step would be to just um, start punching holes and then assembling. Yeah, it's looking great. The puppet is looking great. Any reason you chose orange? Well, I, I guess my aesthetic when I uh, when I design things is I I really like monochromatic with pops of color, um, mm -hmm. and so because of the way that Julian's designed in the character. Uh, and because I know that I want to later on add, you know, fins to the legs and then a plant for the hair. Um, I wanted to kind of keep Julian's sort of original form um, simple so that I can later on add all of the, the fantastical elements. Um, but the one way that I can add that color is through the shorts. So I went ahead and just did that. Uh, and I think it gives it a little bit of, um, you know, a very uh, childlike sort of vibrance and, and playfulness and, and inventiveness uh, to this character, which at this point in time maybe doesn't tell you a whole lot about Julian, but once everything comes together, I think you'll start to get it. Yeah, I also have orange on my end for my lionfish costume. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I was curious about the orange choice. So originally, how did you get into puppet design and creation? Um, I I feel like I've been playing with puppets in, in uh, some way or another uh, for a really long time, even as a kid. Um, and kind of what I wanted, I wanted to celebrate and homage that with my Imelda puppet because I'm the middle child in my family and I have an older sister and she would play with paper dolls and things like that. And so when I was designing my puppet, I wanted to do that sort of like paper doll sort of thing where you have these uh, flaps mm. on the design that allow you to like swap out different looks and things like that. Um, so to get to your, to respond to your question, um, yeah, I've been playing around with puppets for a really long time. Uh, I remember being obsessed with shadow puppets and all those kinds of stuff. And I think that that's sort of um, the first nugget that, uh, <laughs> uh, that I took on as a kid was storytelling. And I found storytelling before I found a love for education and learning. Um, and so being an educator now and working with the kids that I do and in the program that I design for and facilitate, um, I'm able to flex all these different things. And it's been just such a wonderful time of getting to, uh, you know, educate others on, on making practices and things like that, and how these things help to tell stories that we want to tell, but they can also tell the stories of our lives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I have found that this particular position at um, at Maker Ed is the first time maybe ever, definitely the first time in a long time where I feel all of my interests and all of my identity um, just living harmoniously in the same place. Mm. Um, yeah, a, a long road to find that, and I resonate with that. The pieces of me that are artists, the pieces of me that are teacher, um, to fully and happily be in the same place. 
Yeah, I love that uh, because I I think when when you're an educator and you are working with young people, um, there are so many different layers to being in that space already as it is. As an adult in the room with young people, um, conversations can really go in any which direction. And I think that that's such a valuable part of being in that space is that there's a possibility for conversations to go any which way. And I think that's what makes education such a beautiful place to, to be and to work and to live um, and to occupy your mind because it, to me, it feels like it begs to, for me to bring in all of these layers because it's these layers that are then gonna go forward and, and form some of the stories for the experiences that I'm sharing with kids, with young people uh, and with our young adult staff. And every memory that I have of being a kid growing up uh, that involves an educator or a teacher is almost always something to do, as much to do with things that, you know, someone might say is off topic as it is to do with like actual content. Uh, and so I think those connections, the more that we can build them and bridge connections between our personal lives and who we are and the things that we're creating, the more um, permission we grant for kids to, to bring themselves. It's an invitation really to bring more of yourself uh, to that space. And that's the kinds of stuff that you becomes the seed and blooms and germinates later in life. Um, and it's the reason why I wanted to go into education was because of that. Yeah, really, really well said, Jake. I, I definitely find, um, you know, as people, we can have moments of, of shyness or reserve or hesitation. Um, but I think something I always come back to as both a facilitator with young people and a facilitator of educators is that um, your students are not going to do anything that you're not willing to do yourself. Um, and so, yeah, I, over time, have just continuously been finding that um, the more open and vulnerable and curious and expressive that I'm able to be, um, students will, will mirror that. That is not always easy for older folks. There's, there's something that happens along the way. Um, we're taking, taking risks and things around like a learner's mentality or self-expression. Um, those things just like slowly and slowly fade away as we get older. And I think it takes um, some intention to, to be with that and call that back and, like, and to nurture it. Yeah, and you use the word um, authentic, and I think that you know vul it, it's vulnerable to be in a making, in a space of making, to you know to have materials sort of presented in front of you, and to uh, especially as an educator, drop off those materials and kind of say, oh, "Now go, uh, go, you know, make something out of this." It's vulnerable to be in that position, and so I think you're um, doing everybody uh, a, a great service and to yourself most of all really if you are allowing that opportunity that moment to then inspire you know more discussion of of who you are where you've come from things that you learn from your mom things that you learn from your auntie things you learn from the neighbor down the street um things that you know to be true of you, you know your 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 personal history and heritage and things like that all of these things um, are already going to be in the background anyways. So to just make them visible, bring them to the surface is just going to improve that whole experience. I, yeah, I worked on a version two or an iteration um, of my first one. I did not love the proportions on this one. Um, but I also used paper this go around, where in iteration one, I used um, cardboard. And so I definitely noticed how cardboard um, 
is definitely th more thick and, and durable, like you were talking about. Um, and the paper is a little hard to to make certain like gestures stick. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, and that's one of the beauties I think of making in general, um, and especially with something like puppet making, is that it's an invitation to learn about the mechanics of the puppet and also at the very same time to figure out about your own creative voice what choices you would like to make over and over again or for the first time if you want to experiment uh, and both those things become really important so you already pointed out like the type of paper and the quality and thickness of the paper um, to even like how you assemble things and put the, uh, the in this case limbs of our puppets together So what I've got here, this is sort of like uh, doo -doo 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 um, bringing things back from, from part one. And you can already sort of see um, that I've changed a few things and added a few things. And I can demonstrate um, the steps of putting these puppets together. Here my Julian uh, puppet, and I've added some color uh, to his skin, give him some more vibrance, give him some more uh, literal color in this case. Um, and I've also gone ahead and added um, one of his arms and both of his legs. And so he's already sort of in a state where he can tell uh, a good story. Um, and so the next thing that remains for me is to show all of you cutting out some of these pieces. And so I wanted to make sure to actually show the sheet of paper because I think showing process is important um, with anything, especially with uh, making and tinkering and, um, and puppetry. And so what I did uh, since the, you know, the last time that, that we met Aran, uh, was I took, uh, at the end of the episode, I was left only really with an attached um, Julian's head and body uh, mm -hmm. and his two arms. So in the time since we last saw each other, um, I actually ended up losing track of the sheet of paper that I had that had um, the limbs, the arms and legs for Julian. So what I did was I just took um, what I did have and sort of traced out, like just taking a pen, which you can kind of see underneath the marker there, and just redrew again, which I think is something that a lot is really forgiving in this with this project um, is that if you lose track of something or don't like it, you could take what you do like and just go back over and redo it, hmm. make it again. Uh, it's also a great way to sort of think about what the other things you want to add. So I've gone ahead and um, made this blanket piece, which I can also show. Um, but the next thing for sort of fit, finalizing this prototype is to take your pieces, make sure that you're cutting them out, give yourself a little bit of space. And I like to cut all of the, my puppet pieces out at the same time, just so I can sort of see how things map up next to each other. Um, but I didn't do that here. I actually cut the other pieces, uh, the arms and legs before we started filming today. But I wanted to make sure to show all of you what the process is of actually connecting them. So I've got my arm and I've got Julian right here. And so the next thing that I've got to do is take my hole puncher. I've upgraded mine a little bit. Whoa. Oh, and actually I did for totally forget to, uh, <laughs> to mention that as one of the tools. It's a hole puncher, but you can actually use scissors just fine. Just make sure to be careful or uh, access some help. Get mm -hmm. some help if you uh, need some. And so what I'm going to do here is take my hole puncher, sort of map out where I want it to be. Since I know that this is an arm, I want it to sort of be near the end, but not so close that I create like a rip. And I'm going to create the hole right there. That's one side. So now that's half the, the sort of battle for creating this arm and adding it. So I'm going to go ahead and do it on the other side. Same thing again, close to the edge, but not quite fully there because you want to make sure that this puppet can allow you to, here we go, uh, to play with it before it falls apart. <laughs> so that's the next thing here, hole on the arm, hole on the other arm, and now we're going to bridge them together. And here's another option, uh, not another option, but another opportunity for you to sort of uh, add your own personal spin and change things around is you'll notice that I took uh, red and sort of purple fasteners that's on purpose. They don't need to match. I, I, I think that's one of those sort of fun things that um, 
gives gives you the chance to add more personality, but it's not an absolute must. And boom, <laughs> wow. we've got a puppet prototype that's all put together there. And there's Julian. Wow, that is such a beautiful puppet. Thank you. I mean, really, really beautiful. <laughs> and so what I wanted to try to do as well was create like an alternative. Um, so another great thing about these puppets is um, if you could create alternatives for the characters. So I saw that you had two, uh, you held up two puppets. Uh, so you could create multiple puppets. They could share parts and pieces together. But what's really cool is that they still remain entirely removable. So I can take off pieces of this Julian puppet and then hole punch this, which I can demonstrate real fast. Hole punch. Make sure I get that get in there. So that's right there. In this case, I'm going to go with red because it matches Julian shorts. And the next thing I'm going to do is remove this and add this. And now what I've got is sort of uh, the Julian from some of the early pages of the book that we read last time, wow. um, which is Julian in his sort of fantasy, whimsy, imagination state of being a mermaid. And so I wanted to do that, but then honor uh, Julian and his imagination, his fantastic imagination, by making sure that the mermaid fin is actually made out of what's supposed to look like a tablecloth or a blanket. Wow, that is beautiful. I am inspired to add something. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know um, if you remember, but last time I was talking about um, lion's pose and lion fish, or a lion fish. Um, and so now I was watching you. I was like, how do I get this? um costume piece to be kind of like jutting out um mm. so i'm gonna try to do what you did which is a couple holes up here and i love that you have just this bright uh spots of just orange just like blowing out from behind you that like really just gives so much personality to your puppet and um and and really i think uh just conveys the the lionfish uh yeah and i actually went ahead and wrote mindful on your <laughs> on your uh treat huh. sheet from the last time that we spoke yeah i also noticed your fasteners um are small I think maybe compared to mine. So I think that's something I'm seeing with using paper and the longer fasteners. I think mm -hmm. in the future, I don't know if that would be a choice I would make. Um, the longer fasteners seem to work really well with the cardboard, but I don't know, with the paper, it seems like too much. Yeah, and uh, you know, even though, and even uh, you know, between the, the brads maybe that you have and the ones that I have, mm -hmm. there are still more types, more colors, more shapes, uh, and and of course more sizes. Um, so that I think that that gives even more opportunities to sort of play around uh, with the puppet size. You know, like my Julian puppet is probably uh, I don't know four or five ish inches tall, so. Mm tall enough that I could totally make like a short film or a stop motion movie or something like that, but not super tall enough that I would be able to do like, um, sort of like ventriloquist act or something like that. Uh, but Brad's because they come in so many different sizes and shapes, mm -hmm. uh, you can really go wild with what you end up getting for your materials. And that can really change just, um, the, the way that you approach your puppet making. Yeah, totally. I, I had no idea they came in different colors and different shapes. It's a very exciting thing to learn. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I added my costume to the back. I was super inspired by just all the beautiful illustration um, illustrations in Julian is a Mermaid. So I tried to do my own version of that. Um, 
and give my puppet a little lionfish costume. <laughs> Very painterly, the, the, the burst of color and the sort of texture with the, the lionfish sort of like explosion. It looks like an explosion. It, it also, I think, matches with the book so well, mm -hmm. uh, just with the way that uh, the aesthetics work. Thank you. I'm very proud of this. It feels so good. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, do you have any final tips, tricks, advice? Um, yeah, what else, what else do you want to share with us? Yeah, I have plenty. There's, I'll try to keep it <laughs> short and practical. Uh, the first one is just a reminder that this is puppets and puppets are uh, uh, truly forgiving. Like I, uh, that's a word that I found myself using over and over again. And I think that's an important thing to remind yourself of as just a maker or uh, an explorer, a person who's experimenting with something, especially if you've not done this before, that puppet making can be very forgiving. Um, and if you don't like something, you can change something out. You can keep it as a, as a sort of extra piece. Um, and that allows you to sort of adjust and, and, and play around and not feel too precious. I think um, going into puppet making, uh, it could be, you could be racked with choice, racked with decision making about what you want to make. Um, but starting with what you do want to, what you do know, what you what you know you want to create out of your puppet, what colors you want to choose, whether it's uh, orange for a lionfish or if it's the pose that you know you want to do, um, all of these types of things. Start there and then uh, go into new directions and and play around. Um, and then also uh, for some other tips. Um, explore the materials. I think mm -hmm. leaning into what you know that you've got, um, they may feel like limitations, but there are also opportunities, there are opportunities that you can unlock, mm -hmm. no matter what the material is that you've got. Uh, if you've got only watercolors and, and paintbrushes uh, to color your, your puppets with, that can make some beautiful stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and markers, colored pencils, crayons are all different types of things that lend themselves in different types of ways. Mm. Very well said. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, I'm just, I'm super grateful for um, being able to work on this project with you. And um, I feel like I've learned so much from you in the way that you approach making, the way that you approach expression and creativity. Um, and the way you teach and I, it feels really, um, invaluable. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aaron. That really is, uh, affirming in so many ways. And in, in this day and age, in the world we live in, that is utterly, utterly valuable. So thank you. And I, through this process of collaborating with you, um, have also had needed the, these mm -hmm. reminders to find joy, uh, in, in this work and to, uh, to really uh, create as uh, opportunities for self-expression uh, in everything that you can do wherever you can find it because mm -hmm. the world needs more of that. Yes, absolutely. Um, the last thing I want to say is that um, there is a project guide that goes along with this project where you can find um, the steps and instructions and more wonderful illustrations by Jake um, over at the Maker Ed website and blog. Um, and also, we would love to see what you make. We would love to see puppets um, that, that you've been encouraged or guided to make. So um, you can check out the Maker Ed um, hashtag, Maker Ed at Home. Um, you can hashtag Everybody Loves Puppets. Um, and we would really, really love to see what you made. Um, so thank you. Uh, keep learning and keep making. <laughs>